Good morning. So nice to be here with you this morning. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, as uh, most of you probably have heard, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh died yesterday morning. Uh, he died at the age of 95. He died in Vietnam. Uh, he's been, uh, he had been ill for some time. Um, so this was not unexpected, but it's very, very sad news. It's very, it's very sad. He was a, a great bodhisattva, a great teacher, a person of peace. Uh, he seemed to have a remarkable ability to talk about Buddhism in a way that's uh, accessible to folks, to Western audiences, to too many folks. And um, I can't help but be, but be sad. Um, but at the same time, you know, I've been watching what and reading, listening to things that people have have said about his passing. And, you know, he had a particular attitude toward life and death. And I think he would want us to uh, see this time as a time when we can think more about life and death, when we can kind of get in. This body of mine will disintegrate, but my actions will continue me. If you think I am only this body, then you have not truly seen me. When you look at my friends, you see my continuation. When you see someone walking with mindfulness and compassion, you know he is my continuation. I don't see why we have to say, I will die, because I can already see myself in you, in other people, and in future generations. Even when the cloud is not there, it continues as snow or rain. It is impossible for the cloud to die. It can become rain or ice, but it cannot become nothing. The cloud does not need to have a soul in order to continue. There's no beginning and no end. I will never die. There will be a dissolution of this body, but that does not mean my death. I will continue always. So it's, it's with great gratitude and even, and even some joy, I can say, uh, that, that we note uh, Ty's uh, life and death and his passing and his continuation. So um, let's just take a minute here to uh, sit uh, silently uh, to honor him. And there is the mindfulness bell. And the, west, the best way we can honor Thai is to be mindful, to be present, 
to be awakened. Thank you, Ty. So today, uh, the title of my talk is When There Is No Patience for Patience. And patience has been on my mind a lot lately uh, because I've had a little less of it than usual. I think I'm a pretty patient person, but uh, these are challenging times. And this has to do with our current situation. It has to do with uh, COVID, has to do with the temporary closure of our center, the reason that we're only on, uh, on Zoom today. And it's great to be with you all on, on Zoom. It would be nice to be in the Zendo, but it's just, it's just wonderful to see everyone here. And, you know, I don't want to talk about COVID all of the time. Uh, it might be more pleasant not to talk about it. Uh, but it's been on my mind a lot. And it feels like we're at this kind of crucial point because we're very hopeful for a change in the situation, but we're not quite there yet. And it's a tough point to be at. You're almost there, but not quite. And you so want to be there. So patience, it's a challenge. And actually I've been a little, uh, you could almost say obsessive about it. And this grew out of the need to be well, of, well informed to try to make this decision about whether to close the center. Uh, but then it's gone a little bit beyond that. And I, I check the numbers all the time. Every day I check the uh, new case numbers for Minnesota on the Mayo website and in the Pioneer Press and I keep, I keep track of them. And I think that, you know, shows my, uh, my impatience. Uh, I, I so want it to be over. I'm trying to resist this, but I so want it to, to get better that I'm kind of hanging my well-being on these numbers, on these fluctuations, uh, which is not something I would recommend because it can lead to this kind of grasping uh, mentality um, and you just have countless disappointments when you do that. And it may not even help you to have an accurate view of reality. Sometimes it's better to step back because these fluctuations in the numbers might say more about sort of data collection quirks than they do about the actual uh, situation. Uh, but it's hard not to uh, obsess in that way and to put lots of hope on things changing really fast. Uh, things are bad. Just about, it seems like just about everyone I talk to either has COVID or has had it recently or has somebody close to them who has it. And many of the cases are mild, which is very good, but people are still dying. Uh, Kathy and I had, a, had an old friend uh, who's our age who, who died just this week. Um, so it's tough. And I don't want to overemphasize my uh, impatience. You know, I've been practicing Zen a long time, and I think I still have a kind of a deep patience, and I'm going to be okay with this thing no matter how long it takes. And I'll do what needs to be done as long as it needs to be done. But I do have this kind of surface impatience, and I don't think I'm alone in that. And, and I'm hoping that talking about it will be helpful. So I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the decision to partially, temporarily close the building. Uh, and uh, I sent out an email about that, which many of you have read, so I won't dwell on it too much. Uh, but a while back, I started to get suggestions from folks or just inquiries. Hey, have you thought about closing the center due to the rise in uh, cases? So I started talking to people, talked to a lot of people, um, consulted with people, talked to our volunteers, which is important because if our volunteers don't feel comfortable coming to the center, we can't provide our programming. I talked to the board chair, vice chair, uh, our administrative director, talked to the priests, I talked to our COVID committee, um, and the results were pretty mixed. You know, some people thought, really thought, we should close, it's the right thing to do. Others thought we should stay open, it's the right thing to do. Um, and I ended up, in light of this, erring on the side of caution, 
on being careful. I feel like that's consistent with our bodhisattva vows that we might make a personal sacrifice, which is to sacrifice our ability to go in and be together and practice together uh, for the good of uh, everyone. So we closed except for morning and evening weekday meditation. And uh, we said that's through the end of January and we'll reassess at that time. And um, I have to say that folks have been really uh, understanding that a lot of folks did not think it was the right decision, but I've heard from so many people, I know it's a hard decision uh, and I'll be okay with whatever you decide. Uh, and hearing that over and over, I just felt really supportive. And I would just like to thank, uh, really supported. And I would just really like to uh, thank everyone uh, for being so kind uh, in this way. Uh, so we're not a alone in this. I noticed that Clouds in Water in St. Paul closed for two Sundays and they've now extended it uh, to three. And where are we at now? Well, I was just reading the, uh, the paper this morning. Uh, it appears that it's pretty clear that COVID in the nation as a whole has peaked and has started to decline. It's dramatic in some places. In New Jersey, uh, there's been this rapid descent. It's decreased 60% in two weeks. Um, in Minnesota and in Hennepin County, it's harder to tell. The numbers are, are kind of mixed, but it looks like we're approaching the peak or we're at the peak. And most people think a kind of rapid descent in cases is likely. So we're hoping that's really soon and we will reopen as soon as we possibly can. I don't think you reopen when you're right at the peak, but when you get into that, that descent, uh, then you can do that. And I'm really, really hoping for the best case scenario. And, uh, but I can't say to myself or anyone else, I promise things are going to get better soon. Uh, no one knows for sure that rapid descent is not guaranteed and we don't know what will happen after that. There's this really hopeful scenario that uh, COVID will uh, evolve into something that's less lethal that we can live with, but there's no guarantee that will happen. There could be another variant. And I don't like to say that, but I think we have to face the reality of that. So we cannot give up on patience yet. We, uh, we need patience. So I'm going to talk about patience uh, from two perspectives. And the first one is how do we work to end our impatience? How do we turn our impatience into patience? And for those of you who are familiar with the distinction between Theravadan and Mahayana Bo Buddhism, uh, this is an approximation of the Theravadan view, the original view taught by the Buddha, uh, which is the view that suffering can be transformed into non-suffering, that samsara, this endless round of suffering, can be transformed into nirvana. And the second perspective I'm going to talk about is how do we eliminate the distinction between patience and impatience? How do we get a, re a rest from judging all the time? This is good, this is bad. How do we um, accept what is without kind of compulsively trying to change it all the time and hanging our well being on whether it's changing for the good or not? So, how can we rest in the reality of constant change? And this is an approximation of the Mahayana view. Uh, the Zen view, which was developed sometime after the Buddha lived. And it says that samsara, nirvana are the same. Then I'll talk a little bit at the end about how both approaches are helpful, because it may seem uh, that I'm putting the Theravadan view down and I am not. It has its place. So the first of these views, uh, we can change. Uh, we can work on our patience. We can eliminate 
some of our patients, we can fix ourselves. Now, patience is one of the six paramitas or perfections. Sanskrit, in Sanskrit, it is kashanti, kashanti, which literally means patience. And uh, there are three kinds of patience, patience in bearing injury and aggression from other beings, patience in bearing adversity, and patience in following the difficult points of Buddhist doctrine. This is the middle one, uh, patience in bearing adversity. And the way this is set forth in the literature is that it's patience in bearing adversity without being drawn away from the spiritual path, without giving up. So we can put this in the context of the Four Noble Truths, which are about converting suffering to non-suffering. The first noble truth is that there is suffering or dukkha. It exists. Kashanti, patience, is definitely, when there is a lack of it, a form of suffering. It's like, I'm cooped up, I'm unhappy, I'm stuck in my house. Uh, I would so like to get out more, see my friends, go to Zen Center. I would so like to go out to eat, but I'm not doing that right now. Uh, and sometimes I just feel, it's so hard, I feel like giving up. I may feel like I'm being drawn away from the spiritual path. I mean, it's been two years now. This is hard. The second noble truth, of course, is that suffering is caused by desire. Because we desire for things to be different, we're impatient with how things are. Now, this one may be a bit of a hard sell in this context. Uh, if it appears that I'm saying that our impatience is the result of our own desires, does that mean our impatience is our fault? Well, that can't be right. This happened to us. We didn't cause it. But the Buddha's message is not a harsh message. He would not say that our suffering, that this particular suffering is our fault. He would say lovingly that we increase our suffering when we long to change things that can't be changed. When our desire is so strong that we can't accept the truth of the situation, we suffer. When we deny that COVID exists, and many people basically do that. And um, all of us maybe can be tempted to do that, to just say, I've had it. I'm just going to start acting like things are normal and let the chips fall where they may. But if our desire for things to be different causes us to deny reality or be paralyzed by reality so that we just shut down, our desire has added to the suffering. The third noble truth is that we can end suffering by ending desire. We know there are things we can't change, so we end our suffering by accepting those things that we can't change, like the reality of COVID. Now, I'm not talking here about things that can be changed. If we can change things, yes, we do that. But with respect to things we can't change, we can work on our patience. We can gather strength. We can be a good example to others. We wear a mask, take precautions. We can find the wisdom and the peace of mind to sort out the things that we can change and the things that we can't change. And how do we do all that? That's the fourth noble truth, the Eightfold Path. It's a kind of program. It's a program for following the Buddha's way. Uh, we can adopt this program in order to promote Kashanti. And all eight steps apply here. First, there is view, often called right view. I'm going to call it complete view. We adopt the view that the Four Noble Truths are helpful, uh, that the Eightfold Path is a good path, and that it is available to us. Second, complete resolve. <clears throat> Not only do I understand this about the Eightfold Path, but I vow to do it. I am going to reach deep and find a way to do this. I'm going to survive. And not only survive, but do it well. 
and perhaps not only do it well, but even do it in a way that is far beyond what I ever imagined for myself. To do it in a way where I can reach a type of kindness and awareness and awakeness that I've never seen before. So I may find that this incredibly difficult situation could actually be a catalyst for some very deep change, for finding a way to be more kind and effective. That's complete resolve. And that's pretty central to my teaching. Uh, if you've heard some more of my talks, the idea that the very thing that seems to hold you back can be uh, your path to liberation. Third is complete speech. For example, if we communicate to others that we're giving up, what effect does that have? Complete conduct, also known as right action. Do the right thing. For me, that's wear a mask, isolate myself, pay attention, cultivate patience, get some exercise, keep my spirits up, all of that stuff. Complete livelihood, all of this stuff that's good to do, you do it at your work. You bring it to your work as well. Complete effort. You reach deep. Maybe it's a slow and steady effort. Or maybe if you're getting kind of down, you need to kind of shake things up, do something challenging, do something adventurous. Me, I've just been getting outside a lot, moving around despite the cold. Uh, that seems to help. Keeps me awake. Complete mindfulness. Be present with everything even impatience. Be present with it. Feel it. And finally, complete samadhi or concentration, meditation. And we can do this. We can do all of this. We can commit to this program, whether it's a formal commitment or not. It seems like I constantly have a program of some kind. I'm, I'm working on stuff. I have ideas about how I can work on stuff. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it isn't. I constantly adjust it. Sometimes I need a rest, and so I kind of adopt the program of no program, but I keep coming back. And this is kind of a disciplined approach uh, that has saved me many times. And it has a place, and I'll continue to do it, but I recognize that it's not the whole story, this kind of self-improvement thing. It has its limit limitations. Um, and uh, one of those limitations is that if we keep thinking all the time about how if we can just improve ourselves enough, we'll be okay, uh, that can reinforce dissatisfaction with, with who we are. Uh, Pema Chodron says, from an awakened perspective, trying to tie up all the loose ends and finally get it together is death because it involves rejecting a lot of your basic experience. There is something aggressive about that approach to life, trying to flatten out all the rough spots and imperfections into a nice, smooth ride. And sometimes, you know, we just need to reach deeper. A program doesn't seem to be answer. This, uh, the answer. This goes back to being uh, impatient with patience. You know, as in, please don't give me that. I'm tired of trying to make it better. So what is the Zen view, the view that is not about fixing things? I mean, you still end up fixing things. We'll talk about that later. But the Zen view isn't that samsara needs to be transformed. It's that right here in some samsara is nirvana. There is no difference between the two. And... Mahayana Buddhism and Zen uh, emphasizes emptiness, uh, which is also interconnectedness. Emptiness, the idea that nothing has an independent existence. Um, and that is the same as interconnectedness. Everything does exist in a way that depends on everything else. And this is something that Thich Nhat Hanh uh, taught so well. He called his group of monks and nuns the order of interbeing, and he's all about how things inter-are. B 
because everything is connected, no one thing can have any beginning or end. Even when the cloud is not there, it continues as snow or rain. It is impossible for the cloud to die. It can become rain or ice, but it cannot become nothing. The cloud does not need to have a soul in order to continue. There's no beginning and no end. I will never die. There will be a dissolution of this body, but that does not mean my death. I will continue always. Because everything is connected, nothing has a beginning, nothing has an end, nothing is set apart from anything else, not even the Buddha's teaching. And so the Heart Sutra says that from the perspective of interconnectedness, even the Buddha's teaching is not real. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. No suffering, no cause of suffering, no cease from suffering, no path to lead out of suffering. That's a statement that the Four Noble Truths don't really exist. Not that they aren't true, but that any distinction, any plan has its limitations. The Zen approach, rather than saying, I'm impatient and I need to become patient, I need to transform myself, is more like this. I have impatience now. That's just how it is. That's part of the human condition, and I accept it. I inhabit it. I explore it. And I do that by feeling it in my body. Rather than getting trapped in my mind, I look for what does this impatience do to me physically? And I approach that feeling, and I let that feeling be without trying to change it. And I don't do violence to myself by condemning myself. It's okay. I'm impatient Ted. I'm impatient Buddha. We're all impatient Buddhas. That's pretty radical. You know, that doesn't say we're non-Buddhas trying to become Buddhas. It says we're Buddhas now, even in our imperfection. So that's an acceptance of what is. And we don't like to do that because we're afraid we'll get stuck in being our, our clumsy selves if we accept our clumsy selves. We'll get stuck in this loop of impatience forever if we accept that we're impatience. But actually, the very opposite is true. And the wonderful surprise is that if we fully accept and feel and embody the patience, the impatience, I mean, it will transfer on its own. It's been accepted, it's been expressed, it has fully become itself, and then it disappears. We move on and there's no trace. It ceases to exist. If we refuse to accept it, that's what gives it continued life. So we can make that leap into fully accepting who we are in our imperfection. That doesn't mean we'll get stuck there. No, it's the opposite. You accept it, and it goes away, and you move on to the next thing. And eventually, it'll come back, but when it does, you don't attach to it, you don't get hung up on it, and you let it be, and it goes away again. And so, you're just being here for the coming and going. And this may happen in slow cycles, or it may happen in faster cycles, or it may kind of all happen simultaneously, so that patience and impatience are both here. They're both accepted at the same time. Both are always being born and always dying. And this is just vivid life of fully accepting everything that comes along and letting it be, inhabiting this space without looking to the need to change it all. So things are. Things just are. Zen embraces the now. No program, no past, no future. And this is the deep place of practice. It's not a place, really. It's more like the absence of place. 
it's a process, but I'm still going to use this phrase uh, deep place. It's a deep place where we don't have to worry about being patient. We don't have to worry about the pain of seeming to have a separate existence, which is a pain I haven't talked about yet this morning, but it's real nonetheless. Why are we separate? And we don't even have to worry about death with this deep practice. It's impossible for a cloud to die. We take the larger perspective, which includes the cloud and many other things, and we can see that it cannot die. We merely need to see that we are the cloud, and we do that by always being here. Patient Buddha, impatient Buddha. Middle of the road Buddha, giving the talk Buddha, listening to the talk Buddha. So I recommend deep practice for difficult times. I recommend it for all times, actually. If you've been doing this for a long time, you know when things happen externally in the world, we get pretty stressed. This is an opportunity to go deeper, an opportunity to learn new things, an opportunity to try new approaches. And if you're newer and not even sure what this deep practice is, don't worry about that. Just take the next step. Just take the next step on the path. Each step you take is the whole path. And that may not be clear now, but trust me on this. Take the path. Uh, peace is every step to quote Thich Nhat Hanh again. Uh, you can learn more about this. You can talk to a teacher. They can help you with just where you are now to know what that step is. So it's here, 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 and now. It's just now. That's what all the koans are about. They shake us out of our ideas that it's somewhere else. It's not somewhere else. It's here. What is Buddha? Three pounds of flax. I'm asking my teacher, what is Buddha? Because I want to know, I want an idea of what Buddha is. I have this idea of something that could be described to me. And the teacher says, no, this, this thing I happen to be holding, three pounds of flax, or this thing over there. That's what it is. It's just this. So there's this view that we can fix ourselves, the view that we can eliminate that distinction between fixing ourselves and not fixing ourselves. But that's only two thirds of the story. And I'm going to talk about the last third of the story um, in uh, a little bit, uh, not, not in as lengthy a way, but I don't want there to be misunderstanding. So the first third is there are things, things of this world. There are problems, COVID, impatience. The second thing is there are no things, no separate things anyway. Things exist only in relation to each other. No problems, no COVID, no death. And the third third of this is yet there are things. Although things don't exist independently, they do exist in relation to one another. The world is here and we can do our best to take care of it with our patience. And the Eightfold Path is great. And the Theravadan and the Mahayana paths lead us to the same place, which is here, which is taking care of this, which is being this Buddha right here. And if you recognize these three things as coming from the first few paragraphs of Dogen's Genjo Koan, you're doing pretty well. And uh, I, uh, I can make that judgment because there are things after all. So maybe the easiest way to talk about the third third is to say that uh, these three things uh, reflect the stages of Zen practice. Uh, first, we get stuck when we're new to practice. We get stuck on form, on the separateness of things, 
on our need for things to be different. We can't see interconnections. Then with practice, we do begin to see those interconnections. Things kind of disappear. Wow, it's all interrelated. Then, finally, with more practice, we see, oh my goodness, the world is still here and it's bright and vivid and beautiful and we can take care of it. And we can be especially present because we don't need to make that distinction between what's real and not real. So we've got it all present at the same time. In our practice, we have form, we have emptiness. You just can't use words for it, or we don't have them. We can't have them both at once, but whatever it is, the distinction is not there. So, okay, so that's about it. I've taken you through a lot here, uh, starting with a specific problem and then going to this kind of comprehensive view of the whole thing. If you only get a small part of it, that's okay. Uh, it, can, it can take time. And uh, remember that teachers are here to help you. The Sangha is here to help you. And I hope we'll be back together very soon. Meantime, we can have this very lively practice uh, over, over Zoom. But um, uh, regardless of how we're doing it, uh, we all have open to us the possibility of approaching this practice in a really uh, deep way and finding strength there. And that's what I have to say. And I would welcome uh, comments if anyone would like to uh, unmute themselves and uh, jump in with a con with a comment. Hi, Ted. Uh, uh, Hi. Thank you. This is this is Benton. Hi, Benton. I see you. Yes. Uh, thank you for that nice uh, dedication to Thich Nhat Han. Can we get that separate on YouTube from the rest of the talk? Because that might be nice to share with the world. Um, well, possibly we could. Uh, we could talk to some uh, folks who uh, understand the technical stuff and, uh, and uh, see about that. Thanks for the suggestion. And that, that was really, really touching. Mm. Okay. I'm making a note about looking into that. Thank you, Benton. Good morning. Thank My you, name Ted, is for your talk. Uh, okay, I think I hear two people. Julie first, and then the other person, please. Hi. Thank you so much for this talk, Ted. Um, it's kind of like the um, ambulance came to the house right at the right time. Um, <laughs> because I feel like everything is kind of hitting this week. So um, uh, uh, it... Um, it was like uh, putting the oxygen mask on just to listen to this and to get some space to it, a little bit of perspective. And um, uh, um, and and most of all, to, to have patience with myself so that I can have patience with um, the people close to me and living with me, you know? So mm -hmm. um, uh, just, Really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Oh, good morning, uh, Ted. This is Raul here. Uh, just Hi. wanted to thank wanted to thank you for speaking this morning, and uh, I really appreciate the subject of patience. Uh, that's eh, an aspect of my life that has always been a work in progress, and. <laughs> It's kind of paradoxical to me that I, I can, at times, you know, sit down for three hours and create artwork and draw and design um, and do that uh, almost seamlessly. But standing in a, a checkout line at the grocery store um, really can unnerve me at times. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank you overall and uh, yeah, just glad to have tuned in this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. Uh, Raymond, I think you were about to speak. Ted, thank you for your talk. 
And I just wanted to share an example of, uh, from Plum uh, Village, how they explain, or one example that they use for inter-R. And they talk about the waves in the oceans. And if you think that you're the wave, you're constantly, life is tough because you're going up and down. You're being born, you're dying. But once you realize that, you know, you're water, you're the ocean, you inter-R with everything, life can be different. Just wanted to share that example from Thich Nhat Hanh's Plum Village. Thank you so much, Raymond. And please Jennifer. correct me if I got it wrong. <laughs> I think you got it right. Okay, just, someone else was about to speak. I just have a quick comment. Hi, Ted, thank you for your talk this morning. Um, the, the comment I have is oftentimes acceptance and resignation are kind of put together and I feel like they're very separate. Because when you ex when you are resigned to something, then you, I feel like you're just kind of giving up, and that's very different from acceptance, right? Uh, absolutely. You know what I mean, yeah. Because I, I once told a friend that I I had accepted a certain situation, and the response I got was, "Well, don't you want more?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm not resigned. <laughs> I just accept where I am." Um, but anyway, so I, I appreciate that that part of your talk. Right. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Acceptance doesn't mean uh, um, I, 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 I accept injustice or something like that. Not at all. I mean, I accept the reality that it exists, but I don't accept it in the sense that I'm going to give up and not do anything about it. Uh, Ted, this is Deb, and thank you so much for you to talk about patience. And I was thinking um, this week, especially that, you know, with the severe cold and then the um, Omicron is it's hard to get out, you know, even for walks and even to go places where you can normally connect with other people that, you know, I have to have a lot of patience with myself because I tend to like involute a bit and not reach out because of being more introverted. So I don't know, just some comments about that patience and yet, you know, really needing to also connect um, with other people at the same time, because I think it can, you can get maybe too um, isolated in these, mm -hmm. in, in our winter and COVID environment. Yeah, that's that's right. That's right. I'm. That's why I've been trying. To, I just go out for. I go out for a lot of walks or um, or uh, skiing. We went cross country skiing a couple of times. That's really nice, and it's cold out there, so that kind of helps wake you up. But, you know, I encourage folks to 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 get out. Yeah. Um, hey, hey, Ted. Hey, thanks for uh, a really great talk. And this is a. A, a nice subject, I think, just as a good reminder. Um, my name's Dan, and uh, I guess what I have to say, or what I've been trying to do lately is really just when I feel impatient, I'm really just trying to go for it. Like just really, really like whatever it's forcing me to be impatient, I'm like I'm trying to embrace all those things. Like, so it's winter. Yes, we have to like wait inside but like really wait inside, you know, like just make the best of it, I guess. <laughs> or it's cold. Yeah. But get out, you know, just layer up and, and like, yeah, it's cold, but maybe that's what it is. And it's out there to be um, experienced. <laughs> maybe. I don't yeah. know how to take that with COVID, but it's maybe just really, really go for it. Don't get COVID, but experience it all. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are things about the experience that that we can embrace. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, I think with that we can turn it over to our our Doan. Uh, and I would ask the Doan, please.